Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my real pleasure to be here. My first visit to Arkansas, beautiful place. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, present five lectures that are really a sort of uh, a condensation of a course I teach in Minnesota, uh, it's a graduate level course on sparse matrix computations actually, but it has uh, veered a little bit towards data sciences lately. I'm gonna talk about that now. So, uh, so the topics would be, uh, you know, the current stand advanced, uh, uh, the, the current state of the uh, linear, numerical linear algebra, talk about sparse matrices, data, data related, uh, related uh, problems, uh, and then some of the information regarding uh, prerequisites and so on. And I will also have a few MATLAB demos and uh, should mention, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, look at uh, this website here, let's see if I can uh, click on it and see if I have it. Yeah. Yeah, normally that should work, but <laughs> uh, so it uh, should take you to uh, a list of uh, the talks I gave recently, and in particular, uh, the, the talks I'm giving, uh, presentation I'm giving here. And at the end, you will see also a MATLAB uh, zipped file, which contains the demos. And if you downloaded those a few days ago, uh, I have updated that yesterday. So this is the schedule. We have five lectures here, two, Wednesday, two today, two Thursday, and one Friday. And again, uh, this this thing here. Let me just quickly try to see if I can get it to work. Here we go. There we go. Yeah, this is this is my website, on uh, the one that is I just clicked, and you have the, the lectures here. Uh, there's uh, the only modifications I made are added these uh, links to MATLAB demos here. So, the, and this one here is the MATLAB demo. Uh, zip file has everything in it. So anyway, uh, these are this is the schedule. Again, I just now starting with just a little introduction. So it's, it's good to reflect of, on, on uh, what is happening now and go back to similar situation that took place ages ago. In 1953, George Forsythe published a, a, a paper titled "Solving Linear Systems Can Be Interesting." And uh, if you look at the, that paper, actually, in the footnote, uh, he was uh, saying that the original title was different. Solving an interstices is not trivial. That was the, the original title. And then probably the editor, the referees told him, no, no, it's trivial. So I guess interesting to see the parallels. So he, he had, that paper was actually amazing. It has a lot of, uh, uh, he did a survey of the state of the art in your algebra. In those years, they talked about the conjugate gradient in some detail. Preconditioning was the first time that it was mentioned, and so on. And I would say that about 70 years later, we could say that there is something similar going on, and linear algebra problems in machine learning can be interesting. So let's look at what happened in some of these uh, trends in the past. In the 40s and 50s, there was a major uh, issue uh, which had to do with airplanes losing their wings. There was some sort of stability problem and that's called the flutter problem. Uh, and that gave rise to a lot of interest in eigenvalue problems. This is how the QR was discovered in 1963, the LR and QR, there was a lot of research in that area. In the sixties, uh, people were interested in power networks and introduced the idea of general sparse matrix. You know, in the old days, sparse matrices were really uh, uh, related to matrices that come from partial differential equations. But this was different. Uh, they were really talking about very general, uh, you know, networks, power networks, you know, things like that. So, and then in the 70s, a little later, uh, uh, of course, the automotive industry and the aerospace industry dominated numerical algebra with computation through dynamics solving the large linear systems. Uh, the late 80s, we saw an upsurge in interest in parallel compute, 
matrix computations. And then there was a little bit of uh, upsurge uh, in the financial computing. And then currently, we're uh, really talking about machine learning. So uh, this is just to say that in the past, what we, we do in our field, is, uh, specifically, when we talk about sparse matrix computations, has been really uh, dominated by solving problems that come from PDEs. This is when you solve large inner systems, you know, find elements, et cetera. So many, uh, uh, you know, the majority of the uh, problems were related to this. Uh, but machine learning uh, now is appearing in places like, you know, designing materials, even solving PDEs actually also. Uh, so uh, there's a big impact on the economy that was just mentioned earlier. This compare what happened with, uh, with the, the old industries, right? So I think students are, are paying attention to this. And I, I will show you something which is kind of interesting. When I have students go and look for jobs, they prepare slides for two different markets, for two different types of departments. So they have this sort of slide, for example, if you go to math department. So look at these types of things, uh, you know, model reduction, uh, solving Poisson equation, graph partitioning, domain decomposition, et cetera. And if they go to the computer science department, they will just translate those things term by term, you know. So eigenvalue problem becomes PCA, et cetera. You know, MATLAB becomes uh, PyTorch and so on. So I actually had a, a student who was uh, uh, doing numerical numerical algebra for machine learning and he had to go the job for Monmart. Uh, a few years back, it was quite interesting to see that because he, his, uh, what they wanted to do is to study how to influence buyers and so on. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. So also there is a, of course, a big impact on what we teach. I, I just mentioned that this, this tutorial is a condensation of this course that is mentioned here. Uh, but in the past, what I used to do is talk, spend about one third of a class talking about uh, PDEs, sparse linear systems, sparse direct solvers. Uh, uh, I think, uh, and then I will talk a bit about graph stuff, but preconditioning, multigrid, all of this will go in, in that course. Now I don't, I don't teach that anymore. I teach maybe a little bit of uh, sparse direct solvers because there are some interesting graph theory problems associated with those. Uh, but I also talk a lot about graphs in general, uh, dimension reduction, trial of methods for in different areas, and so on. Okay, so uh, this is just a quick introduction as to what will be in this tutorial. I will skip that part quickly. So by the way, I have a lot of slides. So uh, I will skip a lot of slides, okay? Because <laughs> I cannot cover uh, 324 slides in uh, five lectures. So what I would do is give you now is you examples of problems that you encounter. So here is uh, the example uh, I mentioned earlier, fluid flow. You have a, a, a simply a nonlinear PDE. You discretize it, you get a, a sequence linear, uh, nonlinear system of nonlinear equation, then you, you linearize, you get Newton, and you keep, you keep uh, iterating and so on. And this particular picture we will see again in the math lab demo sometime later. So eigenvalue problems are, are very common in actually they were uh, very uh, important in uh, things like when you study vibrations, when you study in you know, structural engineering. Uh, and then it's, they're the biggest, uh, I mean, the biggest users of, of uh, uh, high performance computers are people from uh, uh, essentially quantum mechanics, you know, so electronic structure calculations, and these are very large eigenvalue problems, okay? And this is an example of, this is a very simple example you can uh, easily understand with, uh, you know, a system of uh, weights and uh, springs. And a little uh, later than these things, where, where these things appeared, you saw, uh, you saw I realized that, that uh, uh, PageRank is at the origin of Google. 
they found a very interesting way of, this is when, before Google appeared, I mean, there, there was a, an article where they, they, they published something saying that this is a good way of, of ranking uh, websites. At the time, we're talking about not too many websites, right? The origin of, of the internet, of the, yeah, of the, you know, things like the HTTP stuff. And so uh, web pages, right? So they were, they have a way of, of, uh, of, uh, of ranking this, and then they founded a company, and then you have Google, Google now it's a huge company, right? So this is an example from electric circuits. Uh, you get sparse, this big source of sparse problems, right? Circuit simulation. This is one that I like because it's more of uh, indicating of more, uh, more modern, modern problems. You, when you go and buy something on the, you know, even buying a plane ticket, right? Well, they, 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 they fix the price depending on, sometimes, not always, but sometimes they fix the price depending on the customer. And the way they do that is by seeing how you can influence others to buying that product. So imagine that I, that you, I knew all of you and all of a sudden I, I'm touting this great product I bought, you know, so that they, they would really like me to buy that product so that I, I would advertise, advertise it for you, right? So they would get the price, they would lower the price for me, and then they would charge you more, right? So I could make get the difference if I, if I were smart, but this is what they do. And this is exactly what's done here. So there's a, a, an analysis, I'm gonna skip details. There's a paper, this is from this paper here, and there's, there's a lot of following after this paper. So there's a model that shows you your influence, uh, you know, I think so what you're, there's a utility, for member I, and they try to maximize the utility, obviously. And then it's to uh, what is called the Bonacci centrality. So that's essentially this uh, vector here. This is I minus alpha G, this G is obtained from, from the network times the ve uh, vector of all ones. And that gives you a way of, of prioritizing the prices. So uh, this is some details in here, there are some details. So that's an interesting problem, centrality. You know, there's very different ways of, of determining the importance of a node, okay? And uh, we'll just devote a few slides to that later on. Okay. Uh, then going back to the 1800s, you have list squares. And, a, you know, there's a very interesting article here that discusses these, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the planet Ceres. This is uh, by Gauss. But Ga there was a planet that was discovered, just to, to make it very brief, and then uh, it disappeared uh, behind the sun. And the, the person, this, I forgot the name of the Italian uh, 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 astrologist who discovered it, and then he said, well, it, he, he was desperate to try to find it again, and he called Gauss to try to simulate the, the trajectory or something. And he was able to actually simulate and say it would appear in a few days in this location. And there was magic for them. It was really, uh, you know, literally magic. You couldn't understand how this worked. So that, so the interesting, interesting story. Now there's a more recent, uh, I think uh, I gave this example because I, I was uh, teaching this course and then all of a sudden we had this uh, outbreak of COVID. So dynamical systems are, uh, differential equations of this type for a certain matrix. So this is a bit of the simplest form, but then you have more complicated uh, is, uh, examples like these, where a now depends nonlinearly on y. So in, in this situation, the solution is the exponential of matrix times a certain vector, the initial vector. So this is known. Okay, now in this case, you have to, you have to do the integration by, uh, you know, like, a, solving an ODE. So the example is the uh, model of epidemiology, the SIR model of epidemiology. So you have three groups of people in a, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, like a population, you have susceptible population, those who can be infected. Uh, they're not immune and they're not, they have not been infected yet. And the infectious people, those who are really infected, uh, they would contaminate, uh, contaminate others. And then they remove those who either died or have recovered. 
And then you, you write a very simple, uh, this is, these are very easy to understand. So for example, the, the, uh, the uh, susceptible population is a proportional, inversely proportional or uh, negatively proportional to I, the infectious times, times the, uh, the susceptible itself. And then you come up with, with these equations here. So three system, a system of three equations with three unknowns and you solve it, right? Then you get something like this, actually. Uh, I let my directing this off. I think I can. Right. Okay. So uh, now, if I go here, I go uh, epidemiology, and then you start MATLAB. Okay. So here. Uh, so I have the first example I'm going to show you, show it to you, uh, is I, R, and that's M. This is simply that example, what I would decide is to fix that. that so there is one, I, I should have emphasized that. One thing that's very important here is the, trans, the, 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 the number R0, the reproduction number. So uh, the, the, is, this is the number of people that yet this, uh, uh, someone infected would, would infect, okay? So that's a very important number. If I infect one, uh, around me three people, that R0 will be on average three people, that R0 will be three, okay? And it, it, that, uh, so if, if it's small, there's nothing that will happen. Uh, but if it's large, you will see that it, it can be uh, a disaster. So let's look and try to improve this. And here, this is the population, initial I, initial S and R, uh, what is R0 here? R0 is uh, put it to 1.5. And uh, what I would do is run this thing now. So uh, SIR, it's, it is, uh, yeah, there you go. So it goes up a little bit and down. Now let's suppose I do it, I put it to only 1.0 or 1.1, right? Let's see what happens. All right, or is that plot somewhere? There you go. Goes up as 1.1, but it, it, below a certain threshold, is nothing happens. So, like if I, for example, 1.0, you see it goes down a little bit. You see? So, and then if I could it to five uh, or three, let's say five, it, it would explode. Uh, it goes very high and then down. And so you got curves like these that uh, you see here. Uh, and then I, there's, a, there's a, a, a link that will take you you're here. If you click at this link, I don't want to do it now. It will take you to the latest on this. And the latest variants have an R0 factor of close to 12, one of them. So that's basically basically unstoppable, right? Uh, you know, you can understand the, the thing of the exponential unless you absolutely isolate people 100%. So that really tells you that, uh, you know, it, you know you, in a sense, we were a little bit lucky not to have something that, that was uh, not worse than what we had. Okay. So this is just a list of the problems that you encounter in your algebra. And, uh, Again, skip. Let's talk now about real things, right? sparse matrices. So what is a sparse matrix? Uh, there's not a really uh, a formal definition. It's all vague. You know, it's essentially it's something in, that allows you to take advantage of the large number of zeros. And the goal is to use much less storage, essentially storage, uh, than what you can get, than what you can do with uh, uh, dense computations. One thing that's often uh, not observed is that the inverse of a matrix is dense, but the, when you do the edge factorization, then uh, it, it is actually the L and U factors tend to be relatively sparse. Okay, so. Now, uh, these are ex so, some examples of sparse matrices. And I will just give you a quick 
uh, overview of what MATLAB has done with sparse matrices. MATLAB has started to incorporate sparse matrices in the 90s. In fact, I should say, it's partly because of the appearance of sparse kit, which I, I developed in those days. Uh, so they started thinking of, of putting uh, essentially sparse matrices and uh, it was actually at the beginning, like 1990s, right? So let's look at here. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go sparse, all right. Okay. So what I'll show you is simply a couple of things. One of them is a demo. I have, you can, if you know, you have the time to run these later, sparse zero, the simplest one. So this is generating a, 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 a Laplacian. It's in this case, eight by six. So it's a very small grid. You generate a Laplacian on it, and then you generate the coordinates and then you plot the, uh, the, score, the, the, the grid, essentially the mesh, which is this one here. Uh, as, at the same time, you also look at the, this, the pattern of, of B, the matrix it gener generated. So let's try it here. Okay, so you can see, uh, or am I in the right location? No, probably not, no. Okay, try it again. All right, here we go. This is the matrix. So I have five diagrams, the sparse matrix. That's just, I think you probably have seen this. Uh, oops, sorry, yeah, okay. And then along with this, you see what, what this corresponds to is this, this mesh here, okay? So uh, they have, a point here is connected with neighbors to the right, to the left, and to the north and south. And that gives you those five non-zero entries per row. So I'm gonna skip that. And now let's look at the, the next demo here, which will be, I think I'm gonna skip the, the other one, the sparse two. This one is simple. It just uh, reads a matrix from the Howard Boeing matrix close it and then it uh, shows the pattern. And I should say, this is an opportunity to say a big thank you to Tim Davis because he put a lot of effort to put these matrices in his website. So this is actually one of the websites that they visit the most, grabbing some matrices and so on. Is a, a repository of these matrices. So, and then this, this uh, you see here, you can get the, uh, when you load the matrix, you get, you get generate, uh, uh, this has you could have right inside and so on. So this is all did, uh, stored in this data uh, in this data that you see here. So I'm going to do that. That's two. Okay. Uh, must have lost the, the figure somewhere. It's right here somewhere and it's hiding. Yeah. Now this is gone. Here it is. That's the matrix. Okay. Okay. Now finally. One more demo, and then we go do somewhere else. This is actually interesting because there's another reason why I want to show this mark. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, let's see. What this does is we have a, a Markov chain problem. Mark, okay. Uh, essentially. Okay, is that correct? Yeah. So this is a, it's a triangular grid. I, you'll see the grid in a second, actually. And well, we're just doing, uh, making it symmetric for simplicity. And then I use the graph uh, functions of, of MATLAB. So it generates a graph and then I will plot the graph. And uh, so here's what you see if I did that. Here's the matrix. It's again, you can see why you have, you have this thing that goes down because you have more points at the bottom. It's a grid, it's like a triangular grid. And uh, th that's the matrix. And here's what happens if you look at the graph. So I, I just gave the matrix, just gave the matrix to MATLAB and he drew this graph for me. 
It, he was, a, uh, was able to discover that this was actually a triangular grid. You know, there's no, if I had to look at this matrix and say, well, what does it represent? I could not figure out this by myself. And that, this is one of the things we will see in this class. How, how was this done? And this, uh, see, I'm talking about a class here. <laughs> okay, in this tutorial. This, how was this done? Which kind of methods were behind uh, this sort of uh, techniques? You see, you can see the, the grid here, and it's not quite perfect. Normally, it would be a, exactly rectangular, and, but it's pretty amazing what was done. So this is what you learn by uh, a supervised learning, right? I, uh, so that's it for these demos. There's some things in here you could run as well. So uh, now the main, the goal of sparse matrix techniques is to uh, reduce, of course, computations and memory. And I just want to give an example here. We have we have two sparse matrices. Uh, the, the, you can add them uh, in order n and z of a plus n and z of b, or the, these n and z is the standard notation for number of non-zero elements. So it's it's uh, it typically n and z of a is typically not always is uh, is similar to the size so it's of order n maybe a few times n so this would be order n you can do this calculation order n whereas if you do it in in dense mode it would be order n square now let's go back now to let's go to the details of how these uh, uh, matrices are stored so this is one of the most basic storage formats this is the one used by matlab here's a matrix in here and what you want to do is store the non-zero entries only. So what you do is store the values and then the corresponding row and column indices. So the row indices and column indices are here. So this is called the coordinate format or the triplet format, uh, the different uh, ways of calling it. Okay. So it doesn't matter the order in which these number, the, these look, these, uh, uh, entries are, are entered. This is one of the nice things about this. You can enter all these triplets in any way you want, in any order you want. And that's why it's used as an entry format in packages. So you can get, when uh, you, can, you want to enter a matrix, you enter it in this form and you don't have to worry about the order or whatever. Very useful. A more common uh, format is what is called sparse row or sparse column format, whether you depending on whether you store the rows or the columns. What you do here is you store the rows, uh, the non-zero entries of the rows. So it's, uh, for example, the first row, we have 12 and, uh, and 11, right? And you store along with those, the, the column, uh, the column uh, indices. So this would be four, one and four. And then you have an array here, which points you to the beginning of each row. So this one, for example, the one tells you that the first row starts at this location one, the second row starts at location three, one, two, three, and the third row starts at uh, location six, etc. And then you have an additional thing in here at the end, which tells you uh, the, the beginning of the n plus first, the fictitious n plus first row. So that's the format that's used. And this is how you store the matrices in C in this format. One way of doing it. This is what we use in our, or some of our packages. What you have is simply, uh, let me start with this one here. The two, these two arrays represent exactly these two arrays here. The, the uh, real and, and the, uh, so the values and the column indices, they're here. This is column indices and the real values. There's a pointer, two pointers, so double pointer. And that means that you're still, you're, you have pointers in, in, a, in memory where you take uh, one pointer will store one row and then another pointer somewhere else, et cetera. And then along with that, you have to have the, 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 the length of each, of each row and then the size, and that's it. The advantage of this is you can uh, now, if you want to change the matrix, for example, uh, remove a row and replace it by something else, it's very easy. You can access just that row directly. That this, that's one, one thing that this doesn't allow you because this you have to, if you, if you want to insert a non-zero entry here, you would have to modify the whole thing. That's not easy to do this. The advantage of, of doing it the other way 
restoring the whole thing like this is because it will be compatible with with Fortran. All right, so that the old-fashioned Fortran, and that's what what is used actually here in the in the package by Tim Davis again, Switch Sparse, where they they actually uh, use this format because of the desire to be compatible with with Fortran. Uh, and then there are a lot of packages that use actually this format instead of the one I mentioned. So this is simply storing. These are one one uh, one array for this, one array for this, and then uh, an array for the for the pointers. So these are just uh, ways of storing it. Now, when, once you have that, then you ask the question: How do I calculate with these metrics? How do you do computations with this format? There are two ways. The, was the one of the basic computations is matrix vector product. <coughs> so you want to multiply matrix by a vector, and this matrix is stored in this CSR format. So you do that by doing a number of inner products for the ith entry of the result will be in a product of the ith row of A by X. And so what happens is you take an inner product of a sparse vector by a dense vector. And that means these, these are, remember that these are stored contiguously. So for example, this three here will be stored as just three numbers next to each other, but they have, they have to hit locations, different locations in the vector. So there will be what we call indirect addressing on X. So you have, you access X of something, X of J of something. And then for this one, the same thing, et cetera. And that's what you have in here. So this using, this is using the, the very first uh, data storage that I have. And you can see that I'm, the inner product is accumulated here. This is the value at k times x of location x ki of k. Okay, so that's where the indirect addressing comes in. And the number of uh, operations is just the, the total number, the number of multiplies is exactly the number of nozzle elements you have in your matrix. So it's very straightforward. And then you can, for the, the column version, now if you look at this version here, and uh, I should say, Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so for the uh, for, for this version, what ha what you do is you take essentially combinations of the columns. So for example, I have this one times the first column plus x two times the second column, etc. Okay, and then the last one times the last column. So I'm adding combinations. Of, of, of these columns uh, to the result. And that means that now the indirect addressing will be done on the, on the Y, on the vector Y, right? Because I'm adding this one to a location in, in, this, uh, in, in this scattered location of the vector Y, which is AX in this case. Okay, so enough about this. Now I'm gonna talk about iterative methods. I'm gonna uh, see if there are any questions so far. Sure. So when you talk about sparse matrix, uh, uh, sparse matrix times vector multiplication, you assume no sparsity in the vector. Could you, if, if, what if you have sparsity in the vector? And more importantly, what if you have sparse matrix matrix multiplication? Uh, if that's possible. Or yes. Possible. Well, actually, that, that, that's a problem. Yeah, I think for sparse matrix matrix products, uh, it's, you know, it's possible to take advantage of sparsity uh, in, and you can do it in sort of, sort of efficient way. Sparse to sparse is very important when you solve triangular systems. And uh, that, you know, there's uh, when you solve, because Gaussian elimination is nothing. When you take the edge of factorization, you can view it as a sequence of uh, solutions of sparse systems with sparse right hand sides, sparse triangular systems. And there are lots of techniques that make that, uh, that do that efficiently using topology resort and things like that. So, but for matrix matrix product, it's, it's very, fairly easy to do. And the number of non-zero op uh, number of operations at the maximum is the product of the non-zero entries with the first matrix, the row, by the number of non-zeros in the same uh, the second matrix. So it's a product, and it's not too high. So it could be done efficiently. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the the demand of sparsity. Yes. Is that most CPUs 
a very fast for for dense matrices, but the order and order of magnitude is slower. Yes. For Sorry, I saw. So, for, as you're starting to get a very simple pattern or it's overwhelmed. Right, right, yeah. I, I, I said sparse matrix may be slower on the computer. Absolutely. Than, uh, just using the dense matrix. Yes, I, I, for the uh, 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 interest of the audience, I want to repeat the comment. This is, has to do with the, the fact that sparse matrix computations are a lot slower on modern architectures than dense computations. That's a very important consideration, actually. And uh, there was a time where, where uh, everything was, all the uh, developers of, or the manufacturers were developing based on the performance of the uh, impact benchmark, which is dense, right? And I think that was a little bit, they went a little bit overboard with that because a lot of the computations you see in engineering are sparse. Right, and and then it's uh, if you if you you know they can develop uh, machines that do indirect addressing. One of the key issues is indirect addressing and things like that. So that uh, was addressed a little bit, but still there's still a big gap between sparse and dense. You know, if you look at GPUs, you know, my goodness, you can get ten teraflops out of a GPU now if it's dense. You know, ten or, or ten tens of teraflops. Uh, is low precision and so on, but you cannot get that with sparse matrix computation. You can you can get maybe a few gigaflops, and it's really a, a big gap between the two. But you're doing a lot less operation on the other hand. I think that should be an important consideration for uh, people who develop these this, uh, uh, processors. I think it's really important to, to pay attention to sparse computations. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about basic relaxation schemes. So these are these old fashioned methods for solving linear systems. Uh, and they tend still to be fairly uh, useful in some uh, as preconditioners, for example. And even if you think that they may be outdated, on occasion, you will see something that in machine learning that pops out that says, oh my goodness, we use this, this, uh, this idea from, from ADI, you know. You know, remember ADI? No, they have ADMM, which is essentially similar idea, but used in machine learning. So it's not entirely uh, something to, to ignore, okay? So relaxation type methods were essentially uh, developed for solving linear systems by modifying one coordinate or one component of the current iterate at the time. So this is at the time of Gauss, right? So you, you, you modify one and then the other and then the other, and, so, and then you reach a solution and you repeat and you reach a, a certain solution, the limit. So, but you can formulate uh, uh, some of these methods in, by using uh, the composition of matrix in this form. So for example, gauss seidel amounts to getting from one iteration to the next by solving a triangular system. This is the matrix, the lower triangular part of the matrix, D minus E. So you solve a triangular system, but the right-hand side is this. It's a fixed point iteration, and you repeat this. And this is the same as, uh, you can see that it's the same as modifying the ith coordinate of x, the current solution, to make the ith residual equal to zero, all right? And then you continue. It's a very simple process. That's why it was adopted in the old days. Okay. And if you think of, uh, if you look at the history, actually, these things were developed at the beginning, mostly for uh, solving normal equations. Those are the big uh, problems I, I mentioned, these squares, Sarah's thing, that exactly what Gauss was doing, uh, using this for. Okay, so this is just uh, all these iterations are of this type. Okay, and uh, the, 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 you can think of uh, SOR relaxation is something where you uh, have combination of uh, this is the, the, the instead of having this you, you have a combination of the, the one you get from the standard gauss seidel plus you, uh, the, the one you get the current iterate at, at, at position i so these are there was a lot of work in the 60s and 70s 
on uh, optimizing these processes. And they were, they were the, the methods, uh, the best methods around for some time. So preconditioning uh, could be viewed as a way of using this matrix M that I've talked about here to accelerate, uh, to change the system to solve it uh, a little faster with some of the other methods I'm gonna introduce later. So now the next big topic is projection methods. So the main idea of projection methods is to extract an approximate solution to our problem from a subspace. So you have a, you, you have a, you're solving a linear system or an eigenvalue problem, and you want to extract, you know a subspace that contains an approximate solution, and you want to extract the approximate solution from the subspace. So let's suppose you have uh, a, a subspace of approximate uh, dimension uh, M. So this is the subspace of approximants. So the, the, this is where, the sub, where you can get your approximation from. And you have M conditions. You have to have, you have uh, M degrees of freedom. You need to um, you add M uh, uh, conditions to extract the solution. So these are, these conditions could be expressed through orthogonality constraints. And that's what gives you uh, this projection type methods. So I'm going to talk a little bit about projectors first. A projector is essentially an operator, a linear operator that, so that, that is idempotent. So the square of P is P. And you can think of, of this as uh, a certain matrix and that the square of that matrix is P itself. So if P is a projector, then I minus P is a projector. And they, these projectors are associated with the subspaces. So then the, these are some relations you could see here. X is in the range of P if, if, and only if X is of the form PX, if, on the, if and only if X belongs to the null, of, uh, null space of I minus P. These are all very simple relations to prove. And they're essentially projectors are really associated with decompositions of this type. So this is uh, a way of decomposing the subspace RN as the range of E this is the direct sum with null space of P, which means that essentially that the intersection of the range of and the null space is zero, it's at zero. So uh, now if you have a decomposition like this and you can define this uh, going backwards now, projector on uh, projection to K and orthogonally to S essentially. So let me just skip that. This is just an illustration of, the, of a, an orthogonal projection projector onto the subspace K and orthogonally to L. So you have two subspaces of the same dimension. And the, the only I think you need to state is that PX belongs to K. So you're projection onto K, so it has to belong to K. And X minus PX is orthogonal to L. That is the orthogonal projector, the, the projector and to K orthogonally to L. And F, if L and K are the same, then you have obviously an orthogonal projector on 2K. So uh, let's apply this now to linear systems. You have to solve a system like this, V minus AX is equal to zero. And you're given two subspaces, K and L, both of dimension M. And you define an approximate solution like this. XK has to belong to K, X tilde has to belong to K, sorry. And B minus AX tilde has to be orthogonal to L. This gives you here M degrees of freedom, all right? And this here gives you M constraints. So now you should be able to extract a solution, a unique solution in most situations when you have to have some conditions satisfied, uh, which will be explained in the next ones. So very often you have an initial guess that is X zero. So you're not starting from K, you're starting from X zero plus. So you're searching from, for something in X zero plus K. You have an initial guess and you, you do exactly the same thing. So this is the now subspace of approximants. It's an affine subspace now. And you impose this condition here, okay? So that gives you your solution again. And this is uh, equivalent to saying that X tilde is of this form where uh, delta belongs to K. And then this is the, the new pro problem you have to solve. 
So it's equivalent to just changing the problem the right hand side and so on. Okay, so this is all theoretical. Now I need to formulate this in, in a, in a, with basis, with the matrices and basis, okay? So let me give, let me uh, uh, suppose that I have a basis V1, V2, Vm of V and a basis W1, Wm uh, of L. And then I write exactly these conditions here. Then I would write, I would find that X should be of this form, okay? Uh, where you can see that the delta now is of the form V times Y, Y is a vector of coefficients. And if I write the condition, the orthogonality condition that this has to be orthogonal to L, then this gives me exactly this condition here. And therefore I get this solution. And you can see that there is a matrix that's inverted here. So the only condition really to get the solution is that this has to be non-singular. And there are some, some uh, uh, ways of translating that, but it's essentially that, that's all we have. And this is now a small problem, it's M by M problem, okay? And very often this is obtained as a byproduct of your computations. So this is the prototype projection type method, right? So you have your two bases, K and L, you build two bases and you solve this problem. And then you get, you repeat, you get another uh, set of spaces, etc. So these are just ways of explaining uh, what these do. In the, uh, and then there are some results. I'm gonna skip those theoretical results here. And I'm gonna talk about uh, now one dimensional direction, uh, dimension, uh, sorry, one, dim one dimensional projection methods. Uh, and then we're talking about Freilov methods. So this is what's coming next. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm gonna take two special cases in a very generic way. So any, any situation where you have L equals to K, so you have two subspaces, but now there, there is only one. So L and K are the same. In that situation, when A is, is symmetric positive definite, okay, then this, uh, if you solve the problem, the, if, you, if you solve the, uh, if you do projection methods, projection method with these two subspaces, then the exact solution minus the approximate solution, this, this is the error. The A norm of that error, minimizes the A norm of the error for all Z's belonging to K. And this, this is, I didn't say anything else than, than these three conditions, right? A has to be symmetric positive definite and L equals to K. So methods that are uh, what we call orthogonal projection methods where L is equal to K minimize, tend to minimize the A norm of the error. So, uh, I'm not sure. So I'm gonna just, uh, what is, is, I think I should, I should probably say what, or I, it's easier for me to write it down. So the N norm uh, of the error, for those of you who may not know this, so we say uh, N norm, I'm gonna say, no, no, no. okay. Try to value this in here. A x uh, of, of x. All right, and this would be. All right, and this is a. Uh, it doesn't work with a. So. All right, let's do it this way. A norm of the error uh, is equal to uh, essentially a x. So a based on, on the maximum of, of AXX. Oh, actually I should say AX here. So this is not norm of AXX, all right, to the power half. Uh, no, I should say the power, uh, I'm not too. I'm not. I'm not too in good shape today. Why is that? 
I've never worked in my laptop to the, the height like this. Well, essentially, essentially to the power of half. Okay, I'm going to write it down this way. All right. So it's square root of axx. That's the a norm of a. So you're minimizing this. An asymmetric positive de definite. We know that this is going to be a, a norm. So now the important class of methods here is that of, of uh, uh, conjugate gradient, for example. And then you have uh, the other situation that's very important is when 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 uh, when uh, L is a times k, all right. So when L is a times k, then the N, the, the two norm now of the uh, residual what we call the residual is minimized um, in in uh, the subspace. Uh, so it's minimized over all z's in the subspace k. Very important. So this is uh, for any any situation where you have L is equal to K or L is equal to AK, you have these results that are useful. In particular, you can use show res uh, theoretical results, convergence, et cetera, based on this. So I'm gonna talk now about specifically one dimensional projection methods. So you're using K and L, both of dimension one. So there, they are, uh, this is uh, K and L. And in that case, you can write a, uh, this condition here and you will find that alpha is always, so it, in this case, the system to solve is a one by one system, so it's trivial. You have to divide by alpha and alpha is given by this. So let's look at steepest descent. In steepest descent, you take D, so the, essentially the span of uh, K is the span of R, the current residual, okay? The notation here is R is the current residual, B minus AX. And you also take the, the L, so the, sp the space spent by, uh, by R, again, is, is, is L. So L and K are the same. And the algorithm will be like this, okay? So uh, get R, residual, compute alpha, and then update X. That was exactly what you get. That's the steepest descent for linear systems. Uh, I will make a comment a little bit about how to implement this efficiently. So, but this turns out to minimize, as we just saw, the N arm of the error. Uh, and then uh, this is essentially, uh, it, it essentially minimizing this function in the direction of minus the gradient, right, of F, F being the, the this function is F here. So that there's uh, some ways of developing it uh, or using just projection viewpoint, but you also can look at it from the point of view of uh, a gradient type method, You're looking at the direction opposite to the gradient. Okay, so just from theoretical point of view, if you look at this, as a practical point of view, there's one thing that's not very good here. And that is that I'm doing two matrix vector products. I have AX here and I have AR here. Not very good. So I can do it differently. I think may, some of you may have seen that. So I have, uh, I have a, uh, so this is I'm computing. If I look at the, I'm putting R, okay, uh, B minus AX, and then I'm computing alpha equals, this is AR, so it's, uh, RR, it's RR divided by ARR, okay? So by the way, RR is just the inner product, ARR. And then uh, next I will update the solution, X equals uh, X plus alpha uh, times R, right? So you see you have a metric vector product here and you have a metric vector product here, which is not very good, uh, here, which is not very good. So how do I modify this? Well, let's take the whole thing and, and, and do it. Uh, or I could just show you the MATLAB script that does that, essentially it's the same. So you can just essentially do this the first time, and then, then they have a loop in here. When you have a loop, this would be like that, and then I update the residual here. How do we update that? 
from this equation, the residual now has become the new residual or new, okay, I mentioned that, uh, uh, is gets equal to R, so B minus A times, and then this X plus alpha R. Okay, and you can see here, this will give you, it will give you B minus AX minus alpha AR. Okay, so that's what we have here. Uh, R, B minus AX is R minus alpha AR. Okay, uh, now I have only one major product. And you can you can you can say that maybe this is not as, as accurate. It's actually pretty good. This is no there's no problem. You, you don't have an explicit calculation of the residual, but you keep doing it recursively this way, and it's 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 pretty good. Okay. Any questions about this one? Or if not, there's one question on the chat. Oh yes, please let me know if there are questions. Yes. Applies to both sparse and dense. Yes. What makes them particularly useful for sparse? Those, yeah, okay. The question was whether uh, the projection methods apply both for sparse and dense, and what makes it particularly useful for sparse, right? right? Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Yeah, so uh, nothing really specific to uh, when you look at small problems, you, you tend to have fewer. If you take dense small problems, there are fewer opportunities to, for, to using these methods because you have other methods like dense Gauss elimination or something. But in, this is for large problems where you use uh, projection methods are really intended for large problems where you use uh, uh, you reduce the problem to smaller sub, uh, subspace to, to solve a, uh, then uh, a small dimension problem. So yeah, I, I think they're targeting large problems. But you can have also a large problem that is dense, and you can also use the methods. No, yeah, I guess the, that's the answer. It's really not something specific, except that most most of the time, these methods will be uh, applied to sparse, sparse, large sparse problems. Let's see if I'm doing on time here. Yes, I'm basically done with time. I think uh, I will just quickly talk about. So these are convergence results. So by the way, what I will do is. I don't really necessarily want to follow exactly the schedule that was because it would be not uh, as uh, uh, realistic. So I'm going to just continue whatever I left out in the previous uh, lecture, adapting dynamically by dropping some topics if necessary. So for today, what I will do is uh, I will just complete now just talking about this convergence result very, very quickly, and then end here with uh, uh, questions. And then we can start again with the, these other methods this afternoon. So this convergence result uh, of the steepest descent is based on, on this result by Kantorovich, uh, which is an inequality on really quotients. And once you have this result, it's not very complicated to prove. It uses uh, a convexity of the function one over x. Uh, and, and then once you have that, then you can show this result here. So from one step to the next, the error, this is the error essentially, diminishes, decreases this way. And therefore you can, you can the, the, actually the, pro, the proof is here, it's very simple to prove uh, this result once you have this one, this is the hardest part. And then the, the, this proof itself is quite straightforward. So, and that shows sort of uh, linear convergence, which is more or less what you see. And then I, I will show you later this afternoon, a demo that compares these methods. I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions and we'll resume this afternoon. Questions? Yes, Tim. Um, just to follow up on that question that was asked right. about sparse, sparse versus, versus dense, dense yeah. These methods. So one of the other reasons that you didn't mention but you know of, of course, I'm, I'm just putting words in your mouth, is that if, in the sparse case, um, iterative methods like this don't have to factorize the matrix and the memory usage when you do sparse direct methods, which is my area of, of expertise, they, direct methods can, can fail because they take too much memory, they explode. So, so Yosef's iterative methods for he's describing them basically says, don't, don't call Tim, let Yosef do it, because it's too big. I mean, I can't, I, I've just done. So. Yes, okay, that's, that's, that's right, direct methods, correct. Yeah, direct methods. 
then actually I have a, I have a little demo that shows the difference between yeah. direct and spy. Maybe I'll show that later uh, if you remind me. So that, that uh, yes, so direct methods tend to be, uh, so you, you tend to be very slow for 3D, large 3D problems, and it could be uh, sometimes impossible to use. Yeah, so iterative methods become necessary. And, and that issue doesn't arise with the density. Right, yeah, because you have to store it anyway. Yeah, that's true. 